We are going through our Back to Bible Basics message series, and we're finishing up Genesis. In three weeks, we will get into Exodus, so I will get a reading plan out to you. Uh, next Sunday, Maggie is going to be speaking as I will be on vacation. The following Sunday is our worship in the park service. And then the next Sunday, we will begin looking at Exodus. Uh, and that will take us pretty much up to the Christmas season. So that, that, how exciting is that? Start Christmas shopping. So if, if you're new here, or if you're visiting here, or if you haven't been here in a while, um, I will apologize right now because I am preaching through this series with an expectancy of our church members to have done the reading. So if you have been coming here, hopefully you read Genesis chapters 37 to 50 this past week, or at least recently, because um, with Joseph, there is so much that happens. And if you think of Joseph, most of you, if not all of you, are church people, right? You think of Joseph, and there are things in his life that you could probably think of. Yeah, there's that the coat of many colors and his brothers, you know, wanting to kill him and, you know, the Potiphar, Potiphar's wife. And, you know, you think of these different things with Joseph, uh, perhaps. So I'm going to do what in seminary they would call a survey. So like when you take Old Testament in seminary, they can't cover everything because the Old Testament is this big, right? So they do a survey of it. and It's kind of like flying way over in a jet airplane and just surveying the land. You can see the big picture. But what you don't see is all of the details. So in my readings today, which will be extrapolated from these chapters, you will see some details, but there will be details I won't touch upon. So if I miss something and you say, but pastor, you completely missed this. I did that, otherwise we'd be here until supper. You know, it would be really, or until my voice is shot. Um, uh-oh. Uh, the thing's not working. Um, so... In Genesis chapter 37, I'm going to be reading from the NIV, and you can see the scripture references up there. I will try to tell you what they are in case you're following along in your Bible. I will be jumping around quite a bit. Um, But let's pick up in Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph. Now Israel was also Jacob, right? Jacob became Israel. Now Jacob, Israel, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So Joseph, or Israel, loved Joseph, Israel, loved Joseph more than his other brothers. Now, I don't know about your upbringing, but I could tell you completely that I have loved all of my kids exactly the same. There was no favoritism. I don't love one more than the other. You know, I don't dislike one more than the other. Now, in all honesty, we have one kid, so it's pretty easy for us. Uh, But I was born and raised into a family with five kids, and my parents, I think, did a really good job, I think, of loving us all very similarly. Now, my brother, he was the bad kid. In fact, there was a point when he was young, they thought he might have been demon-possessed. He was that bad. And it was through his whole life until he died an alcoholic drug addict. You know, he read the Bible and, you know, he had great attributes to him. But man, he was a problem child. And oddly enough, because he was a bad kid, my parents showed him favoritism. And their logic was, you know, he's so bad, maybe if we give him extra special treatment, it'll change him. And it didn't work. We got some nice stuff. Uh, you know, I, think, I still think when he was like 10 or 12, they got him this brand new little Kawasaki 100. It was so cool. Uh, I did inherit it, being younger than him. But when you show favoritism, bad things tend to happen. And the Bible, the book of James specifically, tells us don't treat people differently. Don't show favoritism. So, um, take Gary and his family, if they walk in and we say, you get to sit up front because we care about you, you're a terrific tither, you donate more money than anybody else, you get the best seat in the house. That would be completely wrong. And the Bible talks about that in the New Testament, that you shouldn't do that. You should treat people equally. You know, because there will be people in here that can't afford to put a penny in the offering plate. We should treat them with the same love and respect as we do Gary, who you know, puts huge amounts of money in the offering plate. Now, just a disclaimer, 
I don't know what any of you put in the offering plate unless you tell me. I, I'm not privy to that information. So don't show favoritism because it often turns out bad. Would you go next slide? So Genesis 37, verse 18. So Jake, uh, the brothers saw Joseph coming. Uh, so the Bible says they saw him in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Verse 24, they took him and threw him into the cistern. So a cistern is a dry well. They, they, instead of killing him, let's just throw him in this dried well and abandon him there. Verse 27, come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother. So they, the brothers, when they threw him into this cistern to abandon him, they saw this, like, um, like, a caravan coming through, and they said, well, instead of leaving him here to die, let's sell him off as a slave to this group of people. And they agreed. They bought him. And then go down to verse 36. The Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials. So if you have siblings or if you ever work a job, excuse me, if you work a job or you go to school, there's this natural thing that we do, and it's called jealousy. You know, you could look at your brothers or sisters, even in church, you might look, you might have been, been jealous this morning, looking at somebody like, man, they have nice clothes, or man, they have a nice car, or, you know, man, Pastor Charlie is so thin and muscular. Like, don't be jealous of these things. Black makes me look thin, right? Of course it does. Maybe on, on TV, everything makes you look fat, so I'm actually about 20 pounds lighter than I look for you at home. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, don't be jealous of people and accept who you are. God made you who you are. And we see this in the life of Joseph. And we see this in the life of his brothers and, of course, his dad. So if you're jealous, it causes you to do bad things. And we don't want to displease God and we don't want to offend other people. And you see how this is turning out. The brothers are all jealous of Joseph. So, you know, let's kill our brother. No, let's throw him in a cistern and abandon him. You know, let's sell him off into slavery, which is what they did. Nothing good came from that. So let's look at Genesis chapter 39, beginning at verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master when... His master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Let's continue in verse 5. From the time, from the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So, so notice what happened here. We, we could tell Joseph has God's blessing, right? There may have been people, there may be people even right now, that you look at and you think, man, God has just blessed them. But notice what happens. Joseph, in being this upright man, this God-honoring man, is taken as a slave in the Potiphar's house, and he's not resentful. He's not like trying to, you know, plotting his escape and trying to do harm or anything. He's thriving in the environment that he has. And of course, he has this godly wisdom knowing that God has a plan. And Potiphar recognizes this and puts him in charge of all these things. And God blesses Potiphar and his entire household. So if you know people that you see you know, that God is at work in their life, don't fight it. Try to become a part of it. You know, in our church here, you, those of you that were here when I was hired as the pastor almost 14 years ago, think about the situation at the time. You know, the, you were changing pastors. You, we were in a fair amount of debt. With the building needed all kinds of work and so on and so forth. And God has just kept blessing us and blessing us. And we have stories we can tell about what God did. And I think part of that is God had people here, and a fair amount of people left, but people that stayed. I believe that God recognized that, and he honored that. And he said, I am going to bless this congregation. You know, and maybe I had a part of that blessing, maybe I didn't. But you know what? This is God's church, and God worked in his church. We're debt-free. You know, we fixed all kinds of things. We're still fixing things, and buildings always need work. Um, as Doug knows, right? 
Um, but you know what? God blesses who he chooses to bless. And if you could be a part of that, whether you're Joseph or whether you're Potiphar, man, it's great to be a part of that. So look for that. And then um, we're about to fast forward here a little bit. So on the, the next slide at the top, Potiphar's wife lied and Joseph is in prison. So since I'm jumping a big section, what happens, Joseph is being really successful and Potiphar's wife, now Potiphar is Joseph's master essentially, Potiphar's wife tries to get Joseph into bed. And Joseph, being a man of God, says no. In fact, the one day that he's in the bedroom and she grabs him and she's trying to get him into bed and Joseph, being a man of God, runs away but she grabs a hold of his cloak or jacket or whatever and Joseph leaves that behind and gets away from her. He did the right thing. Now, she was so angry that Joseph wouldn't sleep with her, she went to Potiphar and said, look, this slave you brought into our household tried to molest me. And Potiphar became so upset, he threw Joseph into prison, which is where we pick up the context in Genesis 39, verse 20. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So here we see time and time again, whatever Joseph's situation, he honors God and God blesses him. Now, put yourself in this situation. If you're, you do nothing wrong, somebody makes a false accusation against you and you get thrown into prison. Would you be like Joseph and like, I'm gonna be the model prisoner. I'm gonna help out. I'm gonna do everything that I can. I'm gonna do what's right. Or would you be resentful? Would you be angry? Would you be fighting? Would you be, again, looking to escape? Joseph didn't do though. He didn't look to escape. He looked to thrive and be the best person he could be. In fact, as we fast forward, we see that this is pretty consistent. When, even when Israel is taken into captivity, God says, look, thrive where am I placing you? You know, fit in with the people, grow crops, build houses, have families, and I will bless you. And we see this repeatedly. And a beautiful thing as we're looking at this story of Joseph is, if you've been doing our reading, you know where we're coming from. Now, we're not even out of Genesis yet. And you see a certain thread that is going through the Bible. And some of the stuff we're reading, especially as we continue on here, we know what happens after this. And we can see how it's connected to right now and how some of these components are so critical. And it's about to accelerate a little bit here. But we need to honor God and we need to be consistent in this. So what do you do when nobody's watching? Uh, just this morning, I was driving into the church and I needed gas. Somehow my car got to empty. I don't know how that happened, but it, it did. So I stopped at the gas station. I'm filling the tank. Well, I actually I stopped the bank to get a loan before I stopped at the gas station. But, but I'm there and I fill my gas tank up and I'm done. And there's like nobody at the gas station. So I noticed there's some litter on the ground, some trash, right? So I'm picking up some of this trash. And lo and behold, it was actually on the other side. I go over to pick something up and there's a dime. Like, woohoo! Like, it's not beneath me to pick up money on the ground, usually. Occasion occasionally, like it's in a bathroom or something. But, uh, so I picked that dime up and I put it in my pocket. I'm thinking, man, what a blessing. Here I am just picking up litter. I expect nothing in return. And God hands me money. And then you know what I did? It's not in my pocket. I put it in the offering box. Get this, I put 100%, not 10%. 100% of that dime is in that offering box. See, these are the things that honor God. Now, I'm joking a little bit with the dime, but tithing, God notices what you do with your money. Filling out the ISER, God notices what you do with your time, your energy, the resources, whatever God has given you. And if you're serving God, he will multiply what he gives you. He will give you what you need. Now, it's often not more money, but sometimes it might be more money, but don't do it to get more money. Do it to honor God, to love other people. Joseph was consistent. So on the next slide here, let's jump ahead again because Pharaoh, I'm not going to read this part. Pharaoh, who is the head of Egypt, 
has two dreams. And these dreams are driving him crazy. What do they mean? And he calls on all the experts of the land, the magicians, the wise men, and, and nobody could tell him anything about these dreams. We don't know what they mean. Like, I can't interpret dreams. Uh, anybody here interpret dreams? So, Joseph has the ability to interpret dreams. And you know the story where Joseph's in prison and there are two inmates in there that have dreams and Joseph interprets both of their dreams accurately. One of those guys gets out and he remembers that Joseph can interpret dreams. So he tells Pharaoh, hey, there's this guy in prison who could tell you what your dreams mean. So he called Joseph and we pick this up in uh, Genesis chapter 41, verse 15. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. So, you know, we offer spiritual gift inventories where you can take testing, and probably most of you have taken spiritual gift tests. Do you ever see dream interpretation on a spiritual gift inventory? It's not there because it's so rare and so obscure. When you look at spiritual gifts, don't think you're limited to what the Bible calls out when it lists spiritual gifts. It's not an exhaustive list. When you take a spiritual gift inventory, it's not necessarily a complete list. In fact, the one that I like to use, it has craftsmanship as a spiritual gift. And I've had people question that. I've had pastors question that. Why do you have that on there? Which it's not my inventory, it's one I found. Because in the Old Testament, it says God gave them the ability or gave them the gift of craftsmanship. It was a gift God gave so they could build a temple. So there are other spiritual gifts you may have that you don't even realize it's a spiritual gift from God, like Joseph's ability to interpret dreams. So where am I? Oh, okay, so uh, next slide is... Um, oh, seven good years and seven bad years. So these dreams, Joseph interprets them, and you may remember the dreams. I'm not going to get into the details because I honestly would get it wrong, probably. He interprets both of these dreams and said they mean the same thing. There are going to be seven years of abundance. You're going to have all kinds of crops and you know, plants and abundance, but they're going to be followed by four years of famine and drought and not having hardly anything. And Pharaoh believes Joseph, which we pick up in Genesis 41, verse 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. God is rewarding Joseph because he is honoring God. Joseph, uh, I'm sure he made mistakes, but his mind and his heart were to please God. And we see all these attributes playing out in Joseph's life that we can learn from. You know, don't be jealous of other people. You know, just love what God has given you. You know, you can look at your neighbor's house and say, man, I'd love to have a bigger house. Well, lo and behold, if you have a bigger house, now you got, you got to spend all this money to fill it. You got to spend all this extra time to maintain it. You're going to pay more on property taxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these choices that we make, these everyday choices matter, and they're part of God's plan for your lives. In fact, you know, Marilyn and I, we made a lot of decisions early in life One of them is we bought a pretty small house. It was affordable. We didn't buy a house that cost as much as we could afford. We came down from that and said, this is what we're comfortable with. A lot of the decisions we made were really important. We didn't know it when we were making these decisions. But when God called me to be the pastor here, we were able to do that. If if we would have had a big mortgage and several car loans and all this debt, honestly, we simply could not have been able to afford to come here. You know, I had a pretty decent job and the church paid a little bit less and less benefits, but God knows that. God knows where he wants you to be, and we see this in Joseph's life. So he's orchestrating where you're at. If you're listening to God 
and if you have a heart to be obedient to God. So, let me see, next slide here is uh, Genesis chapter 42, beginning at verse 1. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Then 10 of Joseph's brothers went to buy grain from Egypt. Verse 25, so they went up to Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. So what we see here is Jacob, who becomes known as Israel, <clears throat> he hears about grain that is in Egypt, and he sends 10 of his sons. Now, he has 12 sons. One of them is Joseph, who's already there, but that he thinks is dead. So he says 10, but he keeps one home with him because he wants Joseph's brother not to be harmed. Joseph, he thinks, is dead. And I can't have both of these brothers killed. So he sends 10 of them, and he keeps this one home to keep him safe. And the brothers go there, and all this stuff happens. Hopefully you read it or you remember it. And there's a whole bunch of different events. It's kind of unusual. And the brothers finally discover that Joseph is alive. And I think that's where we pick up here. Um, so verse 25, again, I, it says, So they went up out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. And let's keep reading in verse, uh, this is still Genesis 42, verse 26. They told him, Joseph is still alive. So the brothers go to their father, and he thinks Joseph's dead, and he said, he's still alive. Now, could you imagine if you're one of these brothers? You are the reason he was taken into slavery. You went back and told your dad that he, Joseph was dead. There's a lot of explaining to do here, and the Bible doesn't record all of this, and probably for good reason. But we don't know if the brothers had to explain that to Jacob or if Joseph later explains, explains it to Jacob or, uh, yeah, Jacob or not. But let's keep reading here. In fact, he is the ruler of all Egypt. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when, they were told, but when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob re revived. And Israel said, I'm convinced my son Joseph is alive. I will go and see him before I die. The truth will come out. You know, we can go through life deceiving and lying and being manipulative and trying to tell partial truths. And it usually will be found out. But even if it's not found out, God knows about it. In fact, the Bible tells us that Satan is the father of lies. And Satan wants you to tell a little lie, and then he's going to magnify that. And you've seen this happen, right? You start with this little lie, and then you have to keep telling lies to support that lie. And before you know it, you're caught up, and Satan has you exactly where he wants you. And that's what Satan does. He doesn't give you a big lie to start with, because he knows you won't fall for that. You're too smart. Well, not all of us, but some of us, right? Satan throws that little breadcrumb and you're the pigeon, right? Oh, breadcrumb. And he keeps tossing those breadcrumbs until you walk right into his trap. Satan is an expert with this. You know, I said my brother was an alcoholic. You know, go back to when my brother was young. Satan says, have a beer. You feel good. Have another beer and you'll feel better. Man, for those of you who drink or have drank a lot in your life alcohol. What a lie that is. We know it, and we often still fall for it. If one drink, drink makes you feel better, have another one. You'll feel even better. And several drinks later, you feel like crap, and you wake up the next morning with, you know, with a hangover. Like, that's what Satan does. He wants to kill and destroy. But let's move on to Genesis 46, uh, chapter thir or verse 30b. As soon as Joseph appeared before Israel, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph, Now I am ready to die since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. So, you know, this reunion, could you imagine the emotion between both of them? I, I couldn't imagine Jacob thinking that your, your favorite son is dead. And here he is. Now you are in his presence. You're hugging him. 
what an amazing reunion. But let's keep moving. Uh, Genesis 47, I think. Yeah, chapter 47, verse 11. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land. Now, this is where we need to pay attention because this is setting the stage for a lot that's going to happen. Now, keep in mind, they came out of, you know, where God wanted them to be. They went into Egypt for food. They could have gotten more food and went home, but they didn't do that. They stayed in Egypt. And this is going to, you know, start those dominoes fall, falling in verse 27. Now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen. They acquired property there and were fruitful and increased greatly in number. So as you read that, knowing what's about to happen, think about that because that becomes, well, we look at that, right? And we think, man, this is great. What a blessing. And so did they. But this, it's like, stay tuned. This is going to be a problem. And we'll get to it in a few weeks. Um, let's keep going here. Genesis 49. We're almost done with Genesis. We're in chapter 49, verse 28. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, if you're in chapter 49, it lists each son and the blessing that Jacob gave them is recorded. I didn't record the blessing there, just the son's name. But as I read the sons, count them. There is Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulon, Issachar, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Benjamin, and Joseph. Twelve, right? How do you do twelve? Is that twelve? Yeah. Uh, twelve. <laughs> so... How many tribes are there in Israel? Twelve. But here's the thing. Is one of those tribes called Joseph? No. Now this creates a mathematical problem, right? Because there are twelve tribes, there are twelve sons, but Joseph doesn't have a tribe. And Why doesn't he have a tribe? Well, because he has two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and because God so honored Joseph, he says, I am going to give you two tribes, each to your offspring. Now, you know, in our individualistic country, we might think like, yeah, but Joseph got cheated. He doesn't have a tribe. In his culture, where family was so much more important than we view it, you know, we're always about, how am I doing? How are you doing? You know, uh, where, where their collective culture comes into play here, and we often miss this in America, uh, is giving Manasseh and Ephraim, Joseph's two sons, each a kingdom in Israel was a greater honor than receiving a kingdom for yourself. So there's more to play here, and it'll play itself out, I think, as we go through Exodus. So let's go to Genesis 50. Last chapter in Genesis, if you've been reading along, whoo, we're not done, though. Genesis 50, verse 19 it says, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and he spoke kindly to them. Now, think about this. Put yourself in the role of Joseph. As I sometimes say, you know, when you're reading scripture, Put yourself in the role of somebody that's in there and see how you think about it from their perspective. You're Joseph. You have these brothers who were going to kill you. But they didn't kill you. They threw you in a cistern. So you remember being in that cistern thinking they're going to abandon you. You know, they're, they're going to bloody up your coat that your father gave you and they're going to take it back and say that you were mauled by an animal and, you know, they ate you basically. But instead, they pull you out of the cistern to sell you off as a slave. Now, these are these brothers. Now, here these brothers come to you, and there was Joseph's dream, if you remember, about the sheaves bowing down before Joseph, and that kind of comes into play a little bit. But he assures them because he understands the heart of God, and he understands the motive of God. And maybe in your life, you might be going through something right now. It's like, this is terrible. This is life. You know, terrible things happen, right? Joseph went through some really bad stuff. Like, could you imagine if your siblings did this to you? And then you go there and you get lied about and thrown in prison. Uh, and all this stuff is happening to Joseph. And he recognizes it. Look, these are just steps in God's plan to get us where we need to be. 
according to God. So think about this. What if you knew that a physical ailment you have would lead to your grandchild coming to know Jesus Christ? You know, you are sick because your grandchild or somebody else is now praying to a God that they never cared about. And that's, this is just one example because I've seen this play out in life where somebody's going through, it happened in our family, you know, somebody's going through something that they don't want to go through. God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Or why did you cause this to happen to me? Whichever you, and if God could speak to you, he'd say, I need to do this to help somebody you know come to salvation. And then think about that. Is it worth the cost? If you're a Christian and you understand the difference between this life and the next life, it probably is worth the cost. But the trouble is, you don't know when you're going through that, but God knows. God knows what he's doing. And think about Joseph and his forgiveness. How many of us would forgive our siblings for doing something like that? You know, in the church, I mean, not just, just, not just this congregation, but in the church, I have spoken to lots of people who will say something like, I just cannot forgive that person because of what they did to me. If that's you, and honestly, I don't know who said those things. Uh, if that's you, look at Joseph. And I would ask you this question. Is what somebody did to you that you cannot forgive worse than what was done to Joseph? Maybe it was. But this is pretty bad. And this is an example of ultimate forgiveness. And if you want to magnify Joseph's forgiveness by a thousand times, look at Jesus Christ. He came knowing that he would have to be nailed to a cross and die a terrible death so that your sins could be forgiven. You know, we are taught, if you, Jesus said, if you refuse to forgive your brother their sins against you, I will not forgive your sins. The forgiveness is not an option for the Christian. It is a mandate. If you refuse to forgive, Jesus' words, not mine, you will not be welcome into my kingdom because I had to die so you could be forgiven, yet you won't forgive somebody for something they did to you? Did they nail you to a cross? No. Forgive. Yeah. What's next here? Last slide. I know we're getting kind of long here. Lots of reading. Are you still with me? All right, I heard two, two people are still with me. That's, God works. Uh, chapter 50, verse 24. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die but God will surely come to your aid and take you out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is prophecy. Now we read it knowing what happens, but before this prophecy is fulfilled, a lot happens. So stay tuned, come back for Exodus. It'll be next Sunday again. I don't know what Maggie's preaching about. It'll be excellent. Come and support Maggie. Come and you know, learn and be in fellowship. And then the next week, uh, the worship in the park service will be pretty good. If you want to be baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ, let me know sooner rather than later. It's a great place to be baptized down there in the Yellow Breaches Creek. Um, and then the following week, we will start digging into Exodus. Let's pray. Almighty God, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for the lessons that we can learn from uh, people in the Bible. We looked at a lot of people that, man, they made a lot of mistakes, and even Joseph's brothers made a lot of mistakes. And today you present us with Joseph, who uh, seemed to be truly a man after your own heart, somebody that cared about honoring you, that was committed to doing the right thing. Lord, help us to have the same type of character that Joseph did. Let us each identify just one thing in our life that we could change to honor you and to help us love other people better. In Jesus' name, amen. May the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. Go out and love your neighbor as much as Jesus loves you. Amen.